I've seen AI builders waste hours and hours of their time because they're toiling in circles with AI. The primary reason this happens is a lack of a structured approach. Oftentimes they build things too quickly and allow AI to take too much control and they lose the thread as what's, what's happening and why it's happening. Partly I know this through observation, but also partly I know this through experience because I've been one of them and I've done it myself. So this video, my intent here is to actually provide you a three-step process or three different processes that will allow you to actually have more structure when you're building enterprise applications with AI. My hope is by the end of this, as you apply these lessons, you'll actually be able to save yourself hours of time and be able to build the app that you'd like within half the time. Before we jump into anything, hi, my name is Dylan. I'm the founder of Gradient Labs. And at Gradient Labs, we actually help organizations automate their internal processes with AI. And with that being said, let's get into the three different processes that you can utilize to actually build enterprise applications more effectively. All right, so the three steps are simple. We have first, we have preparation, then we have design, and then we have control. So these are three primary lessons that I've actually learned from my experience of building enterprise applications with AI. Now with preparation, this, is, uh, this comes down to a series of things, but with preparation, there's a flow that I tend to go through. So before we jump into this, I'll kind of walk you through a general flow of what I do. So with the flow, I tend to have um, a variety of steps. So I usually create a PRD document. So if you've watched any of my previous videos, you'll see that I create a document in the beginning. And this is kind of the macro guide because oftentimes when you build with AI, they lose the thread quickly. So I break this down into macro. So I'll have macro and then we have micro. Now, the intent of the PRD is to allow the AI to go off and build off little things in the micro, but always be able to reference back to the, mi the macro to not get lost. So the PRD I've used in the past has a basic structure. And that basic structure you can see here. And when I build these PRDs, I build them with AI. So I'll use either um, to start out with gpt 4 and or cloud, and then I'll feed that into O1. So O1 then can build down to more detail. And there's kind of a few different buckets inside of this. So first we have product overview, and this should be limited maybe three to five sentences. This should be quite short. And this should basically convey what is the app's end goal? What should it look like in the end? What's the function that's gonna um, kind of operate? The high level executive summary. Next we have the tech stack. So what kind of technologies do you expect to use? So we'll add that here. Then we have requirements, both non-functional and functional. So functional refers to basically like a login screen. That's something that's needed for an application. Next is how long does it take for someone to log in? So what's the speed at which this happens? That's the non-functional piece. So this is actually quite big. So if I actually broke this down into kind of like chunks, this is probably going to take up 75 to 80% of the document. This is going to be most of the, most of the sections here. Next, we have future enhancements. So this is something that a lot of the AIs like to add when they're creating their PRDs for you. So this uh, future enhancement could be um, improved security, improved caching, improved databases, etc. Next is best practices, and this could be security and whatever else. So this is kind of the structure that we tend to get from these documents. This has worked in the past for me for smaller applications. But when I started building more robust enterprise applications, I realized that this doesn't, this doesn't really do what it needs to do in these types of situations. So I needed something that was more robust and also something that was broken down into micro steps instead of just having uh, a series of phases, I needed it to be um, more prescriptive in a very structured way. So the new type of design that I use now, I kind of shove two, four, and five all into the extra section. So this is the very end of this document. This is the new document. It's all shoved in the back, and I come to that later when needed. I obviously reference the tech stack at the beginning so the AI knows what it's building, but I push a lot of that to the end. Uh, next, we have product overview that stays the same. And then after that, we have um, implementation. So implementation, this is going to be the biggest part that changes and where we focus most of our time, ensuring that it's structured in a way that our AI can follow. Going back to the point that I made earlier, we have macro and micro. So we can bring it out of the micro so it doesn't lose context, grab the macro, and dive back in. And the way I've structured this and the way I've found it to be useful for others is breaking it down into the structure here. So I'll kind of walk you through this. So there's a few comments I made here. So we have different phases, right? So this is phase one, and down here you can see this is gonna be phase two, then we'd have phase three and phase four, et cetera. So we're gonna break these down into phases. And each one of these phases, in my preference, it's gonna have an end-to-end -end application that's built. It's gonna be micro and small. So we're gonna say, okay, what's the smallest version of this application that we can build? That kind of gets to um, connecting the back end with the front end, having APIs, caching, et cetera. 
So it's not necessarily the full app or even V1 of the app, but it's connecting all the pieces so we know that we've connected it correctly. And when we put data at the back end, we're getting data into the front end. So that's one important piece, ensuring that phase one, phase two, and phase three are all separate end-to-end -end, uh, kind of completions to ensure that we're achieving each one of those tasks. So inside of that, then we have micro steps. So we have, first we have tests, functional, and non-functional. So tests is quite important. And the reason I've added this at the beginning of each phase is it acts as a kind of a reinforcement uh, learning mechanism for the AI. Because oftentimes, if you have it write a test for how the function should operate at the beginning, if the test fails, it has tons and tons of detail as to why it failed or what it needs to do to actually pass the test. So you're, in a way, having the AI correct itself in a feedback loop, saving you time and frustration of having to copy and paste errors and not necessarily know why it's not um, fixing itself when it should, and you keep running into the same error over and over. So this is a really key point that a lot of people miss. In addition to that, I have these one through three here. So this is the micro step point. So instead of having phase one and having it generalize different points it should achieve, I ask it to go into really extreme detail, noting down all of the micro steps uh, the AI should take to build this out and have each one of those have checkboxes as well. So we have a checkbox here, but each one of these have checkboxes as well. So it checks those off in a markdown file. So as it makes the change, it tests it, ensures it's correct, goes back, checks the box in the markdown, and then moves to the next piece. So it can keep a thread of what progress has been made and where it's at currently in the macro while it's getting lost in the micro. So that's the first point there. Um, and the same thing applies to functional and non-functional. So the next piece is we're building out functional uh, features, and they're going to have micro steps as well with checkboxes. And each of these are going to have to be tested against the previous test we've written. So once it's built in one function and one micro step, it has to go back to the other micro step where that test was made and test to ensure that it's achieving what it needs to achieve. And then the same thing applies to non-functional pieces. And we, we kind of iterate through this loop and go through the entire phase. Once we've completed that phase, we go to the next phase. And that's kind of the new file structure, the new markdown file I like to create for these implementation plans. Now, after the preparation phase, I like to go into the design phase. So I, I try to kind of build out somewhat of a front end, the design of what I would like this to look like. And then I download that, place it into a cursor file, and I build off of that. And the way and how I create my design is dictation. So I've actually talked to my computer more in the last couple of weeks than I have in my entire life. And I and both my wife enjoy watching it. And I do this through, I would say, two tools today. Um, I would say three, actually, cursor as well. So the point here is that 80% of my time when building out the UI is through dictation. And the way this works is I see screenshots that are provided by the AI. I take the screenshot, I provide it back to the AI and say, hey, you know, this button here should be moved here, this should be a different color, this should be rounded, this should be blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. I dictate to um, the AI and then it and then converts that. So it goes from speech to text, takes the text, processes it, and creates a new UI. And I go back and forth um, with voice. And this has saved me tons and tons of time. People don't realize how long it takes to type things. But if you can speak it out, the AI tends to understand what you're trying to say. So before I use any of the other tools, I actually like to use Claude projects. So I have a kind of a Claude project I labor, labeled, I think it's like app designer or something. Um, I'll share with you the system prompt I use for that in GitHub. And in this, what I do is I'll actually have O1 or GPT-40. They'll actually create a design doc. So this design doc that they create will uh, have some somewhat of an understanding of what I would like to achieve. And usually how I get the design doc is I'll use dictation once again here. And this dictation is then spoken out to either, I'll use Claude, I'll use GPT-40, I'll use O1, whatever else. And I'll then explain to them, here's the vision of the app that I have. This is kind of what I want it to achieve. So it should do these things for this user, et cetera, et cetera. Once I've explained that, then I'm gonna actually get out a design doc because that's what I prompted it to do. I then get gonna feed this design doc into my Claude project, which is the designer. And I asked the designer, here's the design doc, here's my vision. I need you to create a, a, an application design that is both intuitive, helps the user achieve their goal in a seamless way, et cetera, et cetera. And then it comes out with both a updated design doc as well as a actually mock-up. So it gives me a mock-up, usually in React, and I can look at the, the visual. And then in that case, I can start to, again, dictate over and over, asking it to change minor things. And after I've gotten it to a point where it feels kind of good, I won't necessarily spend too much time here. So maybe this is 20 to 30 minutes. And then I'll actually push this over to Bolt. So I've, I've started using Bolt.new quite a lot for front end specifically, not necessarily building out entire applications, but mainly focus on front end because that seems to be what they're really good at. 
And what I'll do is I'll actually send the screenshot as well as the code. So I'll screen, screenshot and code over. So we'll do code screenshot over to bolt.new. And I'll say, okay, here's some code for a basic front end. And here's a screenshot of what it should look like. I'll then ask bolt.new to recreate that. And it'll either recreate something that's identical or kind of a variant of it. And once it's done that, I'll then ha have bolt.new take the design doc we've just had as well. And I'll say, okay, here's the design doc we want to use. I need you to build out the application that's in line with this. And then it'll iterate over time and I'll ask it to take micro steps because as you'll see, one of the trends here is micro steps are key. We can't necessarily have these AIs do one massive step because they get lost quickly because of contacts windows. They, they lack the ability to uh, expand their contacts. Even though some of these models have 200,000 token contacts windows, it's still not enough, not enough when you're you know, uploading an entire application code base. Okay, so we've, we've asked it to do micro steps. It's building it out for us. Once we get it to the point where we actually, we, uh, we're impressed by the UI, we like it, I then download that. And this probably takes me hour, two hours, three hours, depending on what I'm trying to achieve, but it's a lot of voice. So it's a lot of screenshots and voice, me talking to it to make minor edits, me giving it bugs. So if there are errors, it can either, um, sometimes it gives you a pop-up to fix it itself, or you just copy the console logs out and give it to it that way. Once you've gotten to the point where you are happy with it, you can then download this. But one thing really cool about Bolt.new is maybe you're just building a mock-up with fake data. You don't necessarily need to build anything um, real yet. You just want to get feedback from users. Well, you can build a fake mock-up with uh, mock data, and you can share that with Netlify. So Bolt.new has a connection both to Super, I think it's Superbase and Netlify, where if you connect it to Netlify, you can deploy it on a URL. So you already deployed a mock app. You can send a URL to somebody and say, hey, what do you think? That's probably one of the coolest parts about Bolt.new is they're making the deployment process seamless and really easy. So we're done with the design. Now it's time to go into the control phase. So in the control phase, this is really a lot about cursor and ensuring that we keep cursor in, uh, in, in control of not getting uh, too out of whack and compared to the macro vision we have for it. So there's a few things that we can use here. One is cursor, cursor rules. So there's a file called, it's dot cursor rules. And you can use all kinds of things. I've actually, I'll share this as well. So I have, a, I have a GitHub repo. I can share my rules there. These are kind of basic rules. I update them per project, but you can kind of see generally what I'm trying to achieve there. In addition to rules, there's actually a new feature that Cursor rolled out, I think a few weeks ago called Notepad. And I found that Notepad is a really great um, uh, feature for our uh, implementation document. So what I'll do is that that big PRD that we created earlier, product requirements document, implementation plan, whatever you want to call it, that big document, we're actually going to put that into the notepad feature. And what I'll do oftentimes is after maybe three iterations of a conversation with cursor, maybe three to five, I'll at the implementation plan, I usually call it my master plan. And when I add the master plan, I'll actually have cursor reference the master plan before it does anything else to ensure that it's in line with our vision and it gives it additional context. And I found that this is actually, this works way better than what I used to do, which is just have a markdown file that I would add. So if you use Notepad instead of a basic markdown file, you see that actually it focuses the model um, better than just having a straight file. Cursor rules, they're sometimes useful um, for larger projects and larger context. I've seen that the cursor rules actually don't always, um, they, don't, they don't always take effect. And I'm sure there's many reasons as to why this is happening. Maybe I'm just not necessarily using cursor rules effectively, but I highly recommend using Notepad, the new feature, because this is something that I've seen a lot of benefits from. And then finally is context drift. So this is a, is a term that I, I kind of came up with, but I'm sure it exists elsewhere, where oftentimes when you use cursor, a lot of people have super long um, sessions with Composer Agent. And with Composer Agent, when you have these really long sessions, um, you tend to lose the thread and the AI either has a recurring error that keeps happening or it forgets what it was supposed to do in the, in the past when you kind of initiated the conversation, etc. And this happens to the point that I made earlier is that the AI's memory currently is quite limited. They're expanding it over time, but it's limited today. And this context drift where it starts to drift away and forget things, we need to bring it back. And one method I've found that's actually quite useful for bringing it back is creating these handoffs. So if I start to see that the AI is kind of drifting away, I'll have the AI create a handoff. So I'll say, hey, okay, I'm gonna have you pass this off to another AI engineer, and that AI engineer has no context to anything that we've done. So I need you to include all the errors, the nuances, the code snippets, the files, et cetera, into a handoff document, a prompt, actually, I'll, give, I'll ask it to give it a prompt, and then it'll 
kind of write that out for me. I'll copy and paste that prompt, create a new session and give it to the model and say, okay, here, solve this. And by doing this, we're actually chaining together all this context in a way where we're not necessarily losing the thread as much as we would in the past. So as we do this, we're going from one thread to the next and giving it handoffs that iterate. So this would be one handoff, this would be a new handoff, this would be a third handoff, fourth handoff, etc. And then throughout each one of these phases, again, remember, we're using the notepads, so we're actually going to have checkpoints where we at the notepad throughout so we can then bring it back to the macro. And as you'll see from all this stuff that I'm mentioning, when it comes to control and prep, the goal here with using these models to build enterprise applications that are actually quite robust is, is the, the main point that I made in the beginning, right? We have a macro goal, a macro vision, but it's very easy for our AI and probably human engineers to get lost in the macro or the micro, not the macro. So our goal here is to actually have them iterate in a loop over and over and over. So we're gonna go from macro to micro, build something effective, test it, ensure it works, and we go back to the macro and then keep doing that over and over and over. And by doing this, we can actually create applications that are quite robust, effective, and useful. And if you enjoyed this, please let me know. Leave a comment in the comment section and let me know either what resonated, what didn't resonate, and also share this video with anybody that you feel like would get use from it. As I said earlier, if you do need assistance with consulting, and if you do need assistance with implementing automations internally at your company, like I said, Gradient Labs, I'm the founder, so you can find the link in the description to learn more about that. And if you want, you can book a free 15-minute discovery call. I'll see you next time.